Okay, so I'm just going to go through Blakemore and Cooper's study. Um, so Blakemore and Cooper, it's on the development of the brain um, and how that depends on the visual environment. So this is a biological study. So we'll just skip through that. So there's quite a lot when it comes to the background and also I'm just going to go through the visual system and how that visual system works so that you can get a brief understanding um, of it so that when it comes to looking at the neurological analysis you basically understand those findings. So um, a lot of research studies find support for something called neuroplasticity so we've got a bit of a definition of neuroplasticity just here in green so that is the idea that the brain can change and respond to the demands placed on it as a result of experience so it's called neuroplasticity it's sometimes referred to as just plasticity or brain plasticity so brain plasticity is the key theme for the biological area for year two um, so both this study and the other biological study in year two focus on plasticity. So there's a few bits of research that show that actually the brain structure that you have could be different in terms of the structures present and the volume of those structures or the pathways or the neurons that are present within your brain could be different based on the experiences that you've had. So there's a couple of studies there. So there's one by Jacobs who looked at individuals who had received a college education compared to those who had left education after secondary school. Um, so those who had had a more extensive further and higher education, their neurons showed more dendrites. So if you think back to your GCSE biology lessons and you look at the structure of a neuron, and the structure of a cell if you want to give it a quick google on your phone absolutely do um, and it'll show you a diagram and then i'm sure things will become very familiar or you can wait a couple of slides and i'll point that out but if you remember back to those gcse biology lessons you will remember that a dendrite is part of a cell that receives information from other cells um, and that information is then processed by the cell body and then is passed on down the axon onto the next cell or organ or whatever it's passed on to tissue whatever um but it essentially shows that those experiences have created biological changes so the more your education you have the more dendrites appear to be there um, and then there's also a bit of research to show this in kittens so kittens brains show neuroplasticity if we control visual stimuli um, then that is correlated with changes in rna structures so rna structures are basically long single stranded chains of cells that process protein um, now dna stores information and rna expresses that information in the form of features and characteristics so if you think about it in terms of psychology say you have got like one big psychology manual and that manual that big book is everything that we know about psychology but there is only one copy of this book so say that you wanted to find out some information about psychology i wouldn't give you that book i wouldn't lend you that book for you to take home because what if you spilled something on that book and you ruined it or what if you lost it or the dog ate it or something like that you wouldn't give it away because you would then lose the original copy so that original copy that big book about psychology is like your dna so it's like the consistent framework that stays in one place it stays in your library but if a student wants to know something from that book they want to create something from the information in that book they could come to the library they could take a photograph of it on their phone they could make some notes from it they could take a photocopy of it and then they could take that away take it home and create a revision resource out of it so that's basically how dna and rna work um i'm no biologist but that is a, a general summary of how it works so your dna stays your RNA is information which isn't taken away from the DNA, but it's essentially like making a copy 
of that information and then taking it to create a characteristic or create a feature. Um, so the photocopies can also be altered and that's like RNA splicing, but the original stays intact. So the DNA remains the same, but the RNA is taken away for information to be created from it, basically. Now, you don't really need to know that, but you need to know that there are changes in plasticity. It just helps you if, you, if you're thinking, well, what's RNA? I've never heard of that. So we've got a few key terms that you'll need to know here. So brain plasticity is one, which we've already defined. There's also something called visual tracking. So visual tracking is the ability to follow the path of a moving object. So, oh, sorry, bear with. So, for example, if you look at my arrow on there, as I'm moving that arrow... If you followed that with your eyes, that's visual tracking. And depth perception is the ability to judge the position of an object in a space. So in other words, you see how far things away um, from you are. So you wouldn't go to step on a step if it was incredibly far away from you. You'd only step on a step once it was close enough that you thought my leg could reach that or my foot could reach that roller. Um, and lastly, you've got neurons. So these are cells designed to transmit information to other nerve cells, muscles, glands, etc. Okay. So this study is basically looking at cat intelligence, which is the capacity of the domesticated cat to learn to solve problems and to adapt to its environment. So we've got some researchers who have suggested that the physical structures of cats' brains and humans' brains are quite similar in three key ways. Okay, so I'll just go through these three key ways. Now the first way is we have both got cerebral cortices with similar lobes. Okay, so if you just take a look at this, this is a cat brain and a human brain sliced down the middle. So here you can see you've got your cerebellum. So they've both got a cerebellum there, just to show you on this diagram as well. That's your cerebellum and that's your cerebellum. So your cerebral cortex is this um, section of folded brain matter here. So there it is and there it is. OK, so it's called the cerebral cortex. The plural of that is cerebral cortices. OK, now, so we've both got those cerebral cortices. And we both have similar lobes. OK, so if you look at the structures of the human brain and the cat brain, you can see that we've both got a visual area at the back. We have both got an auditory area here. Uh, we've got the motor area and the sensory somatic area, so to deal with your impulses from senses, um, and the sensory motor area, so again, same thing in the cat. So we've both got very similar lobes and very similar structures when it comes to looking at your cerebral cortex in cats and humans. The second thing is that both brains of cats and of humans are gyrencephalic. Okay, so gyrencephalic, if I can pronounce the word properly, gyrencephalic essentially means that both the grey and the white matter is uh, surface folded. So you can see, if you look at this picture of the brains here, that you've got, so you have got kind of very folded brain matter here. So can you see how it's like it, almost as if you've uh, taken the brain and you've you've kind of folded it back on one another as if you're making a paper chain. Um, so the wrinkles or the crevices in your brain are known as succuli um, and, and they're basically like ridges of your cerebral cortex. So that's what gyrencephalic means, that you've got a cerebral cortex that is folded um, so that it's it's got these ridges or these succuli. Um, now... Both human brains and cat brains are gyrencephalic. So you can see here on this diagram, there's your human brain. Again, you can see that cerebral cortex is, is folded. Uh, the surface is folded. And the same on the cat brain there. Okay. Now, that is different to um, some small mammals, such as um, small rodents and small primates like marmosets. 
who have a lysencephalic brain. Now that means that it's it's smooth, okay, so there's no surface folding whatsoever. Now you don't need to know about lysencephalic, but you do need to know about gyrencephalic brains. So both humans and cats have gyrencephalic brains. Or gyrencephalic brains, if you're American. <laughs> now, um, The last thing is that both have grey matter and white matter. Okay, now the grey matter, you can see this is obviously a, a diagram, whereas this is a brain scan. You can see the grey matter comes up as darker, so it's the darker tissue of the brain and the spinal cord. And the white matter is the paler tissue here that doesn't show up as well on the scans. <coughs> now the darker tissue, that grey matter, is made up of nerve, cell bodies, and branching dendrites, okay? Now, the cell body, you can see here, is this part of your neuron. So, your cell body controls all the functions of the cells. It controls your nu it contains your nucleus, sorry. And the dendrites here receive stimulation in order for the cell to become active, okay? So, these branching dendrites in your cell body, that is your grey matter. Now, this paler tissue, your white matter here, is nerve fibres and myelin sheaths, okay? Now, nerve fibres are basically axons. So, axons, you can see here in your diagram, axon there, going all the way through to the axon terminal. Now, axons um, conduct electrical impulses away from the cell body. So an axon that is myelinated, so in other words, coated in this or covered in this myelin sheath, um, are known as nerve fibres. Okay, so the Schwann cells form the myelin to protect that axon, and if that axon um, and the, the sheath that it's in is healthy, then that will mean it actually sends impulses quite quickly. Okay, so you can kind of imagine it as, as this part here, that's your grey matter, whereas from here onwards, that's your white matter. Okay, uh, now the next thing is looking at the visual system. Okay, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about the structures in the visual system and how it works. So, the thalamus of a cat consists of several structures. So you've got the hypothalamus, epithalamus dorsal parts and it says they're nuclear structures such as the lateral geniculate nucleus okay now most of the structures that i've mentioned there are responsible for controlling impulses to your cortex cerebral cortex so that includes the functions of sleep so telling you when to feel awake when to feel tired and memory so it's located um very close to uh, um, a structure called hippocampus which you'll look at in another study which regulates memory um but the key thing for your visual system that you really need to know is your lateral geniculate nucleus which is why it is in bold so this is a relay center in the thalamus for the visual pathway now what that means is information that you have perceived in your environment is then subject to some element of visual processing by the retina. Now, this is then sent to the LGM, okay? So it receives this major sensory input from the retina and it is the main, con main connection for the optic nerve to the occipital lobe, okay? Now, I'll explain that a little bit more on this next slide okay so here whoopsie here is a diagram of your visual system okay so here you've got your eyes um now you've got your cornea and your lens here so your cornea and your lens um they basically bend light to focus it on the retina so you can see that your retina here I've circled is at the rear of your eye <coughs> um, and you'll see that here your cornea and your lens make a convex lens and then through the process of refraction this light where you receive 
that sensory information is refracted through a convex lens meaning that the image that you see is actually inverted onto the retina so it's processed upside down so if you ever hear people talking about how you process information visual information upside down that's why so information is sent through the process of refraction through this convex lens and reflected onto that retina okay now you've got your pupil just find my um, cursor apologies where is my cursor there it is so you've got your um, pupil in the center of your iris okay so the iris is the colored part of your eye and your pupil is the black part of your eye now that pupil dilates to let light in so you might notice and if you haven't I'm sure you'll start putting yourself into dark and light environments now but if you move into a dark space you will find that your pupil that black part of your eye dilates so in other words it grows it gets bigger so that it can try and let more light in if you're in quite a bright space your pupil um is restricted so it gets smaller so it's letting in less light okay now that's just where you'll find that but basically that information like i say is refracted onto the retina now the retina turns that signal into a neural energy through something called a photoreceptor so you've got two types of photoreceptors you've got rods and you've got cones so basically rods help us to see in black and white and gray and cones help you to see in color so they just process different parts of the information okay that you are receiving now that information as soon as it reaches your retina um, on each eye will then be sent for some processing okay so each eye has an optic nerve okay you can see there it's in blue and it's in red so this optic nerve allows the information to travel that you have just received now these optic nerves meet and cross over at um, an area called the optic chiasm. Okay. Now, this information only partially crosses over. Now, this optic chiasm is at the base of the hypothalamus. So, the information is joined together and split at the same time based on the visual field in which it was processed. So we know from the studies that you looked at last year that information processed um, in the right hemisphere has come from the left visual field and information processed by the left hemisphere has come from the right visual field. Okay, So that means that some information will um, not cross over but some will if it was um, processed by, for example, so we might have seen some information with the left eye but we've seen it in the right visual field. So bear in mind that each eye can still access information in the opposing visual field. Just to demonstrate that, if you put your hand over your right eye, but you put your finger, another finger on another hand rather, you put your finger um, in your right visual field, you'll see that you'll, you can still see it up to a certain point. So your left eye is still accessing information from that right visual field okay so that's why the information partially crosses over just because it needs to be sent to the correct hemisphere for processing okay now it's sent then down these optic tracts okay once it's crossed over at the optic chiasm now this information then travels through these optic tracts and end at the thalamus which is where you will find your lateral geniculate nucleus okay now that will then relay those signals to the primary visual cortex where this further visual processing takes place okay now the next thing here is that neurons in the visual cortex are arranged in columns with others that have similar functional properties 
So in other words, those neurons that have similar functional properties will all be in the same column as one another. So for example, one column may respond to horizontal information only, which is what you can see in this first column here. So this column appears to only respond to horizontal information. Okay, now these columns of neurons are arranged into assemblies or modules. Okay, now each module analyzes one small area of the visual field. So there are many modules to complete the visual field analysis. Now, as I said before, they're arranged in these columns based on their functional properties. Now, we're going to look at a study in a second, which essentially told us that these cells of the visual cortex are selective for their preferred orientation. OK, so each column of neurons will be selective in which orientation information it will be able to process. And that's what these green lines here represent. So obviously, like I said, this one's horizontal, this one's perfectly vertical, and then these neurons are basically spread between the two. So you've got Hubel and Weisel's study. Now, Hubel and Weisel said that some neurons are known as simple cells, which fire rapidly when they're presented with angled lines, um, and also respond to dark and light patterns differently. Whereas some are complex cells that detect edges um, regardless of where they're, they're placed. So they basically were some of the first people, I think they even won a Nobel Prize for this, um, where they started to investigate this neuron selectivity um, of visual information. Now, they essentially said that these neurons of the visual cortex are orientation specific. So they respond to lines and edges in a visual field um, in a different direction to the next column of neurons. And the preferred orientation of cells are, distribu are distributed around the clock. So if I just flick back to this for a second, you can imagine these green lines as the um, hands of a clock. So that would mean that one section of neurons, as we know them, assemblies or modules, will process information which is presented at any angle, any orientation, around the clock. So obviously that's, you know, your, your three o'clock, your nine o'clock, this would be your 12 o'clock and your six o'clock and so on. Okay, now um, you might think, how did they measure that? Here's an example of how you could measure it. So you can have a recording electrode here, which records um, the firing of neurons, which is recorded by measuring these electrical impulses of the occipital lobe at the back when we show you a variety of stimulus. Okay. Um, and then later on in time, they also subjected kittens to total visual deprivation. So they reared them in darkness and found that actually neurons associated with the visual system and with your eyes are fewer in those kittens. So actually that presents the idea that maybe we can manipulate the visual system. And that there is a critical period, it says there, and apologies, my pen on my board isn't very good, but critical period, that I should say. Um, so they suggested that you are most susceptible to the effects of visual deprivation between the ages of four and eight weeks. Okay, so in other words, if we start depriving you at nine weeks old, then as a kitten, you're probably not going to see very many effects of that, or the effects aren't going to be permanent. Whereas if we're deprive you between the ages of four and eight weeks, those effects are likely to be more severe, more severe. Okay. Now, they also suggested that many of these neurons are activated by stimulation of their eyes. So both eyes, they are binocular. Okay. Now, in contrast, you've also got a study by Hirsch and Spinelli, okay, in 1970. So they reared kittens wearing goggles, where one eye viewed vertical stripes and the other viewed horizontal stripes. So here's an example of what that might have looked like. There's the kitten, there's the goggles, and I've just drawn on there the horizontal lines and the vertical lines. So Hirsch and Spinelli found that most of the neurons in the visual cortex are monocular. So they are driven by one eye. Okay. Now the preferred orientation of the neurons reflected the pattern that they had experienced. Okay, so e.g. 
there it says if the right eye experienced horizontal lines then the neurons in that visual cortex would be orientated horizontally okay so this suggests that the neurons of the visual cortex do show plasticity okay so that's because they have changed in order to just satisfy that information that they've received so Blakemore and Cooper's study was related to these but their study raised kittens in a world of either horizontal or vertical stripes so they wanted them to experience this world binocularly so with both eyes okay now they used vertical stripes and horizontal stripes so please make sure you know the difference between vertical stripes and horizontal horizontal the easiest way to remember it is based on the horizon that's where the word comes from so if you look out of your window and you look at the last point of the land that you can see that is the horizon and it is flat like this okay so that's your horizon so they aimed to investigate the development of the primary visual cortex in cats obviously um, and investigate if some of the properties such as orientation selectivity are innate as suggested by Hubel and Weisel or learned okay so how they did this is they used a lab experiment they used an independent measures design okay so it's independent measures because the IV is whether the kittens were raised in a horizontal or a vertical illuminated environment and then what we measure afterwards is the visual motor behavior once those kittens are placed in an illuminated environment okay so we place them in an illuminated normal environment and find out if they could detect vertically or horizontally aligned objects okay so we've got a selection of kittens so kittens were studied from birth and randomly allocated to being reared in the horizontal or vertical black and white striped environments. Now we don't know how many kittens were actually used in this research. So the sample size is quite unknown. But we do know that for the neurophysical exam, only two kittens were used. That is one kitten from each environment. Okay, now... The kittens were housed from birth in a completely dark room. Now why we've done this is we want to completely control the visual environment that they experience. So we don't want them to experience any other angles or lines in their daily life. So we keep them in a darkened room apart from when they are put into this special apparatus that we've designed okay so at two weeks of age we start putting them into this special apparatus that we've designed this special environment and they're in that for an average of five hours a day okay now this apparatus was slightly dependent um, dependent upon the condition that they're in but other than that it was exactly the same and as i've previously mentioned previous research suggests there is a critical period in the development of the visual cortex so we are studying them before this critical period and up to the critical period <coughs> so here's the apparatus there's just a little diagram so each kitten stood on a clear glass platform inside a tall cylinder so the inner cylinder was covered with high contrast black and white stripes which were either horizontal or vertical okay so you can see in this diagram we've got vertical stripes so why they stood on a clear glass platform there's two reasons really so the first is so that the environment had no corners or edges okay so if they were stood on a solid floor then those raised in that vertical environment would still have a horizontal line because they would see where those vertical lines met the floor okay so they would still experience some kind of line um and also the glass platform i mean that in this very tall cylinder because it's so tall that the upper and the lower limits are a long way away the cat essentially feels suspended in this world of stripes okay so if they look above them all they see is stripes if they look below them all they see is stripes okay now each kitten also wore a wide opaque black collar so I know it's white in the diagram but I think that's just to kind of show a bit of contrast with the rest of the diagram it was black okay so a wide opaque black collar 
that restricts the visual field to about 130 degrees. So it prevents the cat from turning and looking at its own body. Okay, so it can't even see its own body. Literally, the only thing it can see is this set of stripes. In fact, they said in the study that the kittens could not see beyond its wall of stripes. There was also a top or a lid cover um, and a spotlight beneath this that illuminated the stripes. Okay, now it's worth saying that these kittens did not seem upset by the monotony of these surroundings. Um, they would sit for long periods of time and they would just inspect the walls of the tube. And this was stopped at five months old, which is well beyond that critical period. So we said that the critical period ends at about eight weeks, which is equivalent to two months, whereas we've stopped it at five months. So we're well beyond that critical period now. So it's a very controlled and standardised study. So the cylinders were identical. They were the same length, same diameter. They had the same glass floor. The only difference was the condition of the ivy. The kitten spent the same amount of time each day in the cylinder, so five hours a day. And when they were not in the cylinder, they were in a dark room. And all kittens wore this collar. Okay, so all they could see was the stripes they were being exposed to. That's it. So then we tested their behaviour and we tested their neurophysiology. So kittens were taken after this five months for several hours each week from their dark cage to a small well-lit room that was furnished with tables and chairs and we recorded their visual reactions. We also did a couple of tasks. So a sheet of perspex with thick black and white lines was presented to them and a rod was shaken in front of the kittens either horizontally or vertically just as that little animation on the PowerPoint did. Now that will enable us to check whether the kittens are able to perceive those vertical or horizontal lines or not. And the neurophysiological exam, so at seven and a half months, we take those two kittens, one from each environment, one horizontal, one vertical. We anaesthetise them and paralyse them so that their neurophysiology can be studied. So we present these bright light slits um, where we measure the edges, where we measure, we manipulate the edges of light and record um, information from individual neurons. So we record those um, electrical impulses from individual neurons in order to see whether they are actually processing information that is presented at certain orientations. Okay, so in terms of the findings, we'll go through the behavioural findings first and then the neurophysiological findings after. So in terms of the behavioural findings, regardless of whether the kittens had been exposed to a vertical or a horizontal environment, they were initially extremely visually impaired. Okay, their pupillary reflexes were normal. So your pupillary reflex is uh, what I was talking about at the start of the video. So when you enter a bright space, your pupil will contract, get smaller. If you enter into a darker space, your pupil will dilate, get bigger to let in more light. So that was normal in the kittens, but they showed no visual placing. So visual placing is um, when you lift a kitten up to a tabletop or up to a ledge or down to a ledge, then the kitten would usually put its foot out in order to meet the edge of the table. Um, now, the kittens in this study didn't initially do that. They only put their feet out when the edge was detected by touch. So if you allowed the kitten's foot to actually touch the tabletop, then they would reach out to stand on it. And they also showed no startle response when an object was thrust towards them. So they couldn't make the link between the movement and the vision. Okay. Uh, the visually restricted kittens guided themselves mainly by touch, okay? So in other words, they would walk around the edges of the room, they would walk against the objects, so that's how they guided themselves, through touch. They were also frightened when they reached the edge of the surface that they were standing on, so if they were on a chair or a tabletop, they would become frightened when they reached the edge, and they showed a behavioural blindness. So the kittens raised in a horizontal environment couldn't detect the vertically aligned objects. So, for example, they couldn't detect um, the um, perspex sheet that had the vertical stripes on. Now, in terms of looking at the difference between the horizontally and the vertically raised kittens, only the eyes of the kittens raised in the vertical environment would follow that rod that was held vertically. 
and only the eyes of the kittens raised in the horizontal environment would follow the rod if it was held horizontally. Okay, so in other words, that's showing that they're only detecting the orientations that they have been raised with. So both kittens remain blind to contours that are perpendicular, so those that are a right angle, to the stripes that they had lived with. Okay, so they showed no reaction to the perspex with the wrong orientation, but were startled with the correct orientation. Okay, now some of these effects were permanent, some they recovered from. So they quickly recovered from many of these. So within about 10 hours of them being put into this um, illuminated normal environment, they started to show a startle response. They showed visual placing, so they would start to reach out um, to tabletops and they would jump from the chair to the floor with ease. Okay, so they started to get to a point where they were no longer frightened at reaching the edge of a surface. However, some were permanent. So they always followed moving objects with these jerky, clumsy head movements, and they would often try and touch things that were moving on the other side of the room, okay? So they were well beyond their reach. So that's showing that their depth perception is affected. <coughs> now, in terms of the neurophysical findings, there was no evidence of severe astigmatism that could explain these behavioural responses. So an astigmatism is um, like a kind of a defect in your eye where you have some element of blurred vision somewhere. Um, now, there was no astigmatism. There was a distinct orientation selectivity demonstrating a physical blindness. So we've had behavioural blindness and we've also got physical blindness. So this little diagram that you can see here that looks like a, a starburst and um, this is what the neurons in the visual cortex of a normal cat would be distributed like um, so you can see that they are distributed in terms of their uh, preferred orientation again it goes all around the clock it's got horizontals and it's got verticals so I'll just put a reminder here of what that looked like but if we look at the horizontally raised kittens and the vertically raised kittens, we can see that in the horizontally raised kittens, they had no neurons in the vertical orientation. And in the vertically raised kittens, they had no neurons in the horizontal orientation. Okay, so this means that in the kitten and the vertical environment, horizontal plane recognition cells did not fire off. And the same in the... Um, kittens from the horizontal environment so the vertical plane cells did not fire off in that kitten okay so in other words they aren't there are no neurons in a horizontally raised kitten which are processing vertical information okay so when they're shown that vertical information it's not almost registered by that kitten. So they were showing the behavioural blindness, but at the same time there was no neuron that was firing off a signal as if saying, yes, that is a vertical line, and vice versa for the vertically raised kittens. Okay, now in total, about 75% of the cells were clearly binocular, so they responded to both eyes. Okay, and in almost every way, the responses were like that of a normal kitten. However, the only thing that was very different to a normal kitten was the preferred orientations. Just like we saw here, the preferred orientations are different. And on further analysis, we can see that not one neuron had its optimal orientation within 20 degrees of the inappropriate axes. Okay, so here... So say we've got a kitten who's raised in a horizontal environment, okay, so it's raised with horizontal lines. So that would mean that not one neuron um, had optimal orientation that was between 70 degrees and 110 degrees. Okay, so that means all the orientations were either here or they were here. Okay, um, and in total, only 12 were in 45 degrees of it. Okay, so only 12 were either 
from here on or from here on. Okay, 12, that's it. All right, and this was significant when they did a chi-square, so very, very significant. You can see their P is less than or equal to 0 0.00001. Okay, so it's a very significant finding. But there was no large regions of silent cortex corresponding to the missing cortical columns because of underactivity. So in other words, there was no um, area of the brain that, that appeared to be silent in terms of processing. Okay, so it wasn't that that part of the brain just isn't being used. What it is, is that the way that the brain processes information has changed in line with the environment that they've experienced. So we've got a few conclusions. So visual experiences in the early life of kittens can modify their brains and have profound perceptual consequences. A kitten's visual cortex may adjust itself during maturation to the nature of its visual experience. A kitten's nervous system adapts to match the probability of occurrence of features of visual input. So in other words, if they have never experienced a horizontal line, then their nervous system would adapt because it knows it's probably never going to experience that kind of, of line. Brain development is determined by the functional demands made upon it. So your environmental experiences rather than pre-programmed genetic factors. And the environment can determine perception at both a behavioural and a physiological level, at least in cats. However, it's questionable as to whether these results can be generalised to humans. OK, so there you go. There is the um, link to the original paper. So have a go at writing yourself a reference. You can see there you have got all the... Um, information about uh, the journal, volume, page numbers, article title, authors. And that's what your reference should look like. Okay, so make sure you've made some nice thorough notes on that study and we'll discuss it in lesson and we'll also evaluate it.